we uh, kick it off. All right. So uh, <laughs> good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Wagner, and uh, this is another professional development webinar uh, brought to you by Innovate Connecticut. And I'm here with two fantastic women tonight, Liz Radai and Ashley Pereira. So thank, thank you both of you for joining. And before I have both of you introduce yourselves, I just want to share a little bit about what Innovate Connecticut does and why I, uh, I started it. So uh, the whole intention of Innovate Connecticut is to help educators uh, by now by sharing knowledge and best practices with other educators and really to promote innovation across the state through through this entire process. So um, I'm not an educator, but I'm married to an educator and they're amazing people. And what I was hoping to do is is help them by letting them share with each other so they don't have to necessarily redo what other people have already done. So that's sharing curriculum and sharing best practices. And you're gonna hear some really cool things that, that Liz and Ashley are doing tonight that I'm hoping some of you out there listening could use in your classroom or with your students or with your children uh, to maybe give them some ideas. Um, and you don't have you don't have to come up with it yourself because I have two professionals to do it for you. So, so uh, why don't I have you both of you introduce yourselves and then we'll we'll jump into what the topic of tonight is. So, Liz, if you could share a little bit about yourself before we have our discussion, that'd be great. Sure. My name is Liz Radde. Uh, right now I work for Skills 21 at EdAdvance. So EdAdvance is one of the six regional education service centers and we are the one in the northwest corner. Um, we uh, at Skills 21, we have an 18 year history of doing challenge based learning with middle and high school students um, where they are looking at real world problems and solving them using uh, coming up with their own unique so solutions, creating prototypes, um, apps and um, companies, businesses, all kinds of different ways to solve real world problems. Um, and in this kind of time of uh, school closure, remote learning, we also created an individual personal interest project um, that I'm sure I'll talk more about on the webinar tonight. Um, but yeah, my prior to being at Ed Advance, I was a classroom teacher for 16 years, 10 of them at a boarding school working with um, students with learning disabilities. Uh, I have a background in math education. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And then Ashley, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself as well, please. Sure. Yep. Yeah. I'm Ashley Pareda. I am the owner of Greater Good Consultants. I started the company in 2012. Before that, I was a middle and high school science teacher. I taught seventh grade and then went on to teach high school and just really enjoyed everything to do with science. As I was a teacher, I realized in working with inner city kids especially that there was often this deep disconnect of what students wanted to be in terms of their career and the requirements to be that. So I would have students who said they wanted to be an engineer but didn't even know what an engineer did or wanted to be a doctor but were literally failing my chemistry class. So what I decided to do to A, increase their engagement, but B, to also kill two birds with one stone, so to speak, is I revamped my entire curriculum at the high school level to focus on the NGSS, but through the lens of STEM careers. So I still taught the same exact content, but every lesson was done through the lens of a STEM career, which ended up becoming careerinstem.com, which today is used by over a million kids per year, which is incredible. Um, I guess it's pretty simple, it's pretty organic. It's just everything that I wish I had as a teacher and that I created for my own students that I now have on my website and also Teachers Pay Teachers. Um, and then I have the pleasure of working with people like Liz in STEM education consulting for curriculum projects. That's right, me. So, so thank you. And as, uh, as the audience can see, these are experts in this field. Uh, and again, I always, I always share, I am not an educator. I, I actually work in human resources. I just consider myself the connector that helps bring together amazing people like yourselves and then helps be like the the voice, if you will, to share this uh, on, on, on my platform. So so tonight, uh, you know, we, you and I, the three of us were brainstorming what can we do to help all of our educators and what could we share tonight? So our, our topic is helping students understand how their interests impact their future careers. So what I really hope, I'm hoping that everyone listening gets out of this or if you listen to it on the replay uh, on YouTube 
is you get some some resources that you can you can again use in your classroom or with your students or with even with your kids if you're you know if you're a parent mm -hmm. um, to really help back to what Ashley said help try to connect the interests of kids with the education they're they're doing to a future career and you know the three of us have had this conversation there is no time too early to help kids think about their careers yeah. so my kids I have two in elementary school and one in preschool. I've done an, uh, a career week in my my son's elementary school for the past two years where we brought in just professionals to talk to the kids mm -hmm. about like, hey, this is what we do. And it wasn't to it wasn't to get them jobs, right? We weren't trying to get them jobs in first grade. It was just so they were aware that, hey, a, vet, a veterinarian exists or you could be in the military or you could be a firefighter or you could be a nurse. And that was the sole intention of it. So mm -hmm. I think exposing to kids, the earlier the better when it comes to careers, uh, just so they get a sense of what's out there. So, so Liz, why don't we start with, uh, with what you're doing with Skills 21 and a little bit about this personal interest project you mentioned. And you know, the other thing I, I wanna mention is we will make sure to uh, include the link um, to Skills 21 and Careers in STEM in the show description uh, of, of the video uh, and the audio when we put it on the podcast, just so people know how to get in touch with both of you. So yeah. Liz, we'll, we'll have you go first. Great. So um, in March, as we saw this COVID thing kind of coming at us um, full speed ahead, we knew that we wanted to um, do something different. It looked pretty apparent that schools were going to close. And as we, had, you know, in March, we thought, oh, maybe schools might close for two or three weeks, um, you know, and now um, how quaint those little thoughts were. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was an opportunity for kids to take this time to explore their passions and not just keep doing Google Forms, Google Worksheets, Google Classroom. Um, we wanted to make sure that kids could take an interest um, or a passion or something they were curious about and turn it into a project. So we wrote a curriculum that has um, three phases, discover, create, and share, that um, walk a student through the process of designing a project um, based on their interests and then doing this project and sharing it with the world. It is on a free platform at pip.skills21.org, um, which like Nick said, will be in the links. Um, so the curriculum, which is free and can be used for any students, whether they are connected with a class or not, um, they walk through and they decide what kind of project they want to do. Do they want to build something? Do they want to solve a problem? Do they want to learn something new? Um, we've really encouraged a lot of kids to like think about that thing you've always wanted to learn. Like you're really into manga and want to learn some Korean. Great. Um, you know, go do that. You. Um, you know, you want to, uh, we've got all kinds of projects, but you know, you want to learn a little bit of Italian to speak to your grandmother. You want to learn how to cook meals because you see your mom doing so much work or your dad doing so much work and you want to be able to help. You want to think about your garden for the summer because, you know, you're going to be home all summer and now's the right time to plant. Mm -hmm. um, so just telling, taking kids and saying like, learn something that you've always wanted to learn, didn't have the time. Um, I've been doing a ton of crafting and creating um, while I've had extra time. So we now have over 200 students in Connecticut doing these projects. Um, we will be hosting a small competition for anyone that wants to compete um, their projects to show off what they have. and. What we're really excited about is because we have this platform, students also have a final kind of portfolio of what they've done to share it. So it's not just like, oh yeah, I learned Korean. Like, no, you've got a, a whole portfolio that shows your work, which is great for middle school kids looking at high schools, high school kids looking at colleges and they wanna share it um, you know, with college counselors, with future employees or employers, um, with their family, however they wanna share it. So that's been pretty exciting work. Um, yeah, and, and Liz, I was going to ask you, I, I think you, 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 you semi answered it. What, what ages is this appropriate for? Is, is elementary school too young? Is it really more middle and high school? So we've, um, we've written the curriculum for to be appropriate for, we'd say fifth through high school. So okay. we have um, a ton of middle schools are using it right now. Actually, we have I think we have more, we might have more middle school students on than high school students, it might be about 50 50. Um, but I have to say middle schoolers are so 
creative and innovative and have such great ideas um, that they are really getting a lot out of it. Um, as are our high schoolers and they, you know, they come with two different lenses. We have a bunch of high schoolers. We have some that are specifically using this PIP to prepare their for something for their college application, like an art portfolio. And they're saying, well, I had to do this anyway, but now this is motivating me. Um, and one of the things for me is that school doesn't always value all the learning that kids are doing. Um, and this is a way that connects that learning outside of the classroom to what they're doing inside school. And they are kind of getting credit for the learning that happens um, in PIP. Um, and in when we wrote the curriculum, we also knew that kids were going to end up isolated. They're going to be at home. They're not, you know, they're going to be bored. They're going to be, you know, not speaking to people. So in almost all of the the lessons that kind of go through it, um, we incorporated some kind of um, collaboration. So they have to share their idea with another person via Zoom, Google Meet, Hangout, um, call a friend, you know, FaceTime a friend, um, share it with somebody in your house, ask other people for their feedback. So we really, you know, for them to complete their PIP, they have to be interacting with other people. And we thought that was really important too. Um, I know my own kids are missing connections with their friends. Um, I'm missing connections with other people. So uh, we wanted to make sure that we were encouraging kids to connect around their ideas as well. Yeah, I, I think I think you bring up a couple great points that I just want to highlight. Number one, and again, not that there's anything wrong with whether you use Google Classroom or Seesaw or whatever the online platform is you use to, to share your curriculum and assign work. I think the kids, it's, it, it definitely wears on them doing it every single day because most of them were not doing this like this every single day in school, right? I mean, right. my second grader, they they didn't use the computers that often in school. They, they you know, it, yeah, they had access to the devices, but it, they weren't learning everything through Google Classroom. Right. So I, I love how you're giving kids an outlet to be creative and get away from the structure of whatever the platform is. I, I think number one, I think that's great. And then the second thing you mentioned is is fantastic because loneliness is a really big issue before the COVID-19 situation. And this is just ex is accentuating the, lo the loneliness epidemic in, in the country where people are totally disconnected, like you said. So we have people that are missing their friends and their family. And, you know, I just see my own kids just light up when they do a Google meet with their, their teacher in their classroom, how excited they get to see their friends, right? So the fact that you made a requirement of this project to have to connect with someone, I think was a great idea. That was good, good work. Thanks. Yeah, we just wanted to make sure, again, you know, most of the projects kids are doing not on the computer. So we wanted to give them another way to, to do work um, and, you know, do some hands on stuff. And we've done some initial surveying. We're going to do some more kind of digging. But one of the things that we are finding is that most of the kids are saying this is very different from what they're doing in most of their other classes. Um, and for us, um, students having voice and choice, actual voice and choice, where they are designing both the, I mean, everything from the learning outcomes to how they're going to get there is so important. And it's so different than, okay, today is multiplying fractions and here's mm -hmm. what you're going to do. And here's the worksheet where they're saying like, okay, my end goal is going to be X and to get there, I'm going to do A, B, and C. Mm -hmm. um, and they're coming up with you know, the time management plan, and it hits on so many of those portrait of a graduate skills, high leverage skills, um, you know, work skills. Uh, we've started digging into some of the projects and are really seeing, we'll start talking about some of the specifics, but they're, um, they're hitting on all the NGSS practices and it's so authentic. Um, so how, how, how have you seen it tie back to what they might possibly want to do from a career perspective for, for the for the older kids. Yeah, so let me give an example of a project. We have a student who uh, his project or her project, I'm not sure, is to breed betta fish. So the student, I'm, I'm sure their parents are thrilled. <laughs> the, <laughs> Better than I'm, cats. Yeah. <laughs> um, I know nothing about breeding betta fish. Um, this student is interested in it. Apparently. 
Um, just from reading the proposal, I can see that the fish need to be exposed to each other between glass because, you know, these are the fighting fish and they have to make a, a bubble nest where the eggs can go. And so there's a process that this student is learning right now of how to breed these beta fish. And he's actually interested in um, the genetics of it as far as if you breed this kind of color with this kind of color, what kind of fish are you going to get? Um, so when you think of the NGSS practices and the um, the cross-cutting concepts and a DCI, there's biology is right in there. They're designing an experiment. They're collecting data. They're using, uh, they're an analyzing data. There are so many of these steps are right there. And so maybe Ashley, you could talk about how this can connect to your work. Yeah, so for me, every experience should be able to connect back to your to your future in some way, whether you realize, oh wow, I really love beta fish, I would be interested in aquaculture, or oh man, a fish stink, like I definitely don't wanna do this. Because I feel sometimes society puts so much of an effort and emphasis on what do you wanna be? What do you wanna do? What did you like? But it's equally important to know what you don't like too. <laughs> so that's well, that's well said. Press projects, anything to do with at least defining something that you're interested in and giving you the space and framework and scaffolding, which it sounds like you have, helps to at least find out if you like it or, you're, or you don't. Your student who's interested in this beta thing, maybe after the time he's done doing it, he's like, nope, not for me. Glad I tried it, but not for me, moving on. That's great. That's equally as good as if, yes, I wanna be an aquaculturist, I'm opening my beta business tomorrow. Like either one of those outcomes is very important. And I guess the only other additional perspective I would add is the parent's perspective, because obviously parents are involved in their students' education like never before. I have a first grader and a incoming kindergartner, so preschooler. And I think a lot of times too, we make it harder for ourselves than it has to be, especially when it comes to things like careers and personal interest projects. It really can be super simple, especially when you're just like trying this out and just naming it. So like my daughter, she's four going on five. She loves to build. So one day I was just like, Mila, that's some really cool civil engineering you've got going on there. And of course she's four. She's like, oh, what's civil engineering? It's like, well, civil engineers like to build stuff just like you. So she's four. That was a very age appropriate way to break down stereotypes because she's a female. I've encouraged her that she can indeed be an engineer. And I've named something that relates as a career to something she already does. It's not like we have to go on these field trips and do these virtual experiences. It's just whatever you see your kid enjoying, try to make a career connection. And I guess that could be a good segue into what I do is just providing a Launchpad, an exploration platform for students to explore STEM careers. So similar to your platform of how to explore your interests, mine is how to explore careers. So I have a lot of different pages. I have over a hundred different career profiles. Each one includes a virtual job shadow, downloadable info sheet, and a fun game. So a way for students to do something that relates to what that real professional does. So it's just a very simple starting point if you find your student is interested in biology. We could go through together some biology career pages, see what you like, see what you don't like, and then take it from there by doing those triads, the games. And I mean, obviously that's a more fancy way. We could do some research together. We could watch videos together, whatever, but at the very basic level, and I guess just my, my key take home point for teachers listening to this today and parents is that it doesn't have to be crazy. It can be very simple, just naming something that relates to a career really opens more doors than you'd ever be aware of just naming something. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think that's a really great point because again, you know, in, I, I, I'm in South Windsor and we, uh, not this year, but the previous three years, we did a, um, a career fair, not to get kids jobs, but to expose kids to jobs right. in, in high school. And it was just amazing to me how many jobs kids didn't realize existed, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess if I look back and I look at myself in high school, I was probably the same way, right? I mean, I, 
I, I'm an organizational development consultant. I couldn't have told you what that was when I was in high school or college for that matter. So, so again, I, I think just the, the opportunity to explain and share um, careers with kids is, I think it's just eye opening because I think it kind of shares what, what is, what is out there. Right. And, and actually you mentioned you have a hundred on your, your website. That's, a small sliver of, of the number of careers in STEM uh, that are out there. So it's, it's just, uh, it's just, it, it always amazes me how many opportunities there really are out there. And I think the more we can do it to just kind of educate kids on it, the better. What, uh, actually, I wanted to just follow up question for your site. So is your site is careers in STEM.com. I'm sorry, career in STEM careers in STEM.com. Is it more focused towards students, towards educators, towards parents? Will everyone benefit from it? Like what's the, what's your target audience just so our listeners know who should go to the site? Yeah, so <laughs> it's both. It's um, both? So okay. go to careerinstem.com. It's for educators because that's my primary customer. Teachers buy my stuff. If you buy my stuff, it gives you the private links. So a student coming to my site would be like, oh, this is stupid. This is for my teacher. <laughs> but if you go to, if you buy something, you would get all the links to the, like the career pages, the profiles, the blah, blah, blah. So it's, the site is set up for teachers because that's my main customer. It. But the people who are using it are mostly, like you, like Liz said, between five, fifth grade and 12th. Okay. And they're using it through, through their educators in school, basically, is, is how they're right. doing it. I got it. Okay. Yeah, so I sell things like WebQuest, Scavenger Hunts, where they are using it in Google Classroom. Actually, every kid downloads it, makes their own copy, submits it to their teacher, and does the career exploration pieces on their own. And I think that's the beauty of Despite the craziness, the beauty of everything going on right now is that kids have time. So usually if you're in a, a normal traditional class, the bell rings. And whether you are interested in that or not, that's kind of it. So unless you're a super, super on top of it student, you would go home and ask your mom, oh, I learned about this. Can we learn more? 90% of kids are not doing that. <laughs> so this is a really great opportunity for every student to be able to take it the next step further right there and then if you're doing a lesson and you find oh this is really cool google's only a, qu a click away from google classroom so it's an unprecedented i'm so tired of hearing that word but it's an unprecedented opportunity as much as it is a challenge and i think if more kids just took that next step on their own the world would be so much smarter because imagine what it would be like if you could do that I met, I, again, all the craziness, but imagine if you had the opportunity every lesson, if you were interested in it, to just Google it and learn more. I think that's one really unique thing of what's going on. So, so Ashley, just for the educators that, that, that are listening now or that are listening to the replay, is there, when you introduce the idea of careers to students, is the introduction dramatically different from, say, a fifth grader? to an eighth grader to a 10th grader you can you just explain a little bit about how that looks different no different for me no um so for example all my lessons are delivered through the lens of a stem career obviously the science that a fifth grader is ready for is different than a 12th grader but physical science is still physical science and a physicist still does the same thing just in the <laughs> you would obviously the way the lesson would look would be a little bit different but no i i mean the career is the career and the way that it it's the way I've written all my lessons is the lesson is delivered through that lens of the career so the lesson would look different but the career itself wouldn't really because it's kind of always the same no matter what so no that's why I say a lot of times people make it harder than it has to be and I think also there's just a large lack of awareness so the earlier you start the better they'd be prepared to do more advanced dives but I, America is just not quite there yet it seems to me in terms of career exploration but getting there a lot of a lot of progress being made yeah no I, I think it's I think more and more people are realizing how important it is and you know you actually I do a lot of career content uh, mm -hmm. outside of this um, just with my own personal brand and I think more and more people are actually taking this COVID-19 situation and realizing 
you know, that they weren't prepared for something like this, or they weren't prepared from a career perspective to make a career change or a career pivot. So I actually think there's going to be a renewed focus on, you know, how do you get yourself prepared for your career if you haven't had one, or if you're even in a career, how do you prepare to change your career if you need to? So. Yeah, and I think the most important thing for educators to know is that it doesn't have to be something extra. I know as an educator, I would freak out every time the new standard came or the new SRBI or the new acronym. Like, I'm tired of it. I know. I get that. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be extra. It should be seamless within the curriculum. And there should be plenty of opportunities to explore STEM careers because people really do science in the real world. So why shouldn't you just name the career that relates to what you're already going to do in the classroom or yeah, and, and, just, and easily, easily tied together. I like that a lot. Right. So, so you both gave a lot of really great examples. I just wanted to ask Liz one more thing that we didn't talk about before. So with, um, with skills 21, historically your organization has done expo fest, mm -hmm. which is the mm -hmm. big, celebration in person um i believe usually in the june time frame right correct may june yeah end of may early june yeah so can you just share because we will get back to the point where we can have expo fest so can you just share with with the audience that don't know what expo fest is what it is why skills 21 puts it on and really what it's what is it celebrating because i, I want what i don't want is i don't want to lose sight of we are going to get have big in-person events again at one point and yours is just one that, you know, I haven't been personally, but I've heard amazing things about it and students just rave about it and the educators rave about it. So if you could just share with the with the audience what that is, then that'd be great. Yeah. So Expo Fest is a student innovation competition um, celebration of uh, student work. Um, students typically in a class work on a project for the entire year. Um, addressing a real world problem with a um, workable functioning prototype that is um, some sort of uh, prototype service solution to this, um, to the problem that they are addressing uh, within the context of that class. So um, uh, a chemistry class several years ago was looking at the problem of, um, you know, Connecticut, we get a lot of snow, we need to melt the snow, and that salt that we throw everywhere is harming the environment, it's bad for animals, bad for all these things, but cheese brine has a really high salt content. So they worked with the University of Wisconsin, because we're better than Wisconsin to learn about cheese brine, um, to figure out, so how can we use something that's more natural to melt the snow in a way that's not gonna be as harmful? So that was their solution. Um, we had kids in a bio class looking at, okay, so we know that we want more life in outer space. We want to send people more to space, but we can't grow plants there because it's no gravity. So, um, they came up with, uh, geotropic graviculture, which was some sort of contraption that would allow you to um, grow plants in zero gravity. So these kids are coming up with amazing solutions in categories like NGSS, advanced manufacturing. So we work with um, classes that are doing machining, CAD design, um, any of those kind of CTE courses. Uh, they do that kind of work. Uh, technology. We have a grant in STEM plus computer science. So kids are coming up with um, computer science solutions to real world problems. Um, Expo Fest itself is high energy. Think of like super fun trade show science fair turned on its head with steroids. Um, the projects are being judged by higher ed faculty, people from the world of business. Uh, that are just looking to see the student work. The students are so excited to share their work with everybody. Um, the work, not only do they come up with the actual prototype, but they have a, a product name, they have a marketing plan, they have a business plan, they have the lab report behind it. Um, they have 
students that do a live pitch. So it really does become not just the project, but a whole business around it. Um, you know, cost and benefit analysis and, you know, great, this project works, but it costs a million dollars and isn't really worth that much in the real world is not a good solution. Um, so it's fantastic. We are obviously not doing it live this year, but we are hosting our, um, we're doing it online. So kids are still gonna be doing a live pitch to us that we'll be recording. Um, judges are still judging and we'll be hosting a Facebook Live on June 5th to give awards. So um, all has not been lost. And uh, I think like everybody, we have discovered the power of Zoom and Google Meet and Google Classroom as far as being able to continue to work on these team projects. And um, kids have also learned the beautiful world of the pivot and um, you know, this all started in March when they still had three months, you know, most of March, all of April, all of May to still keep working. And um, some of these projects have taken dramatic pivots. And that's exciting because you know what, like, we all had to pivot too in the real world and um, learning resilience and, you know, still holding yourself to the high standards and not just giving up is something we're really, really proud of the students for doing and saying like, no, we're, you know, you can still do this, figure it out. We're still working from home. You're going to figure it out. So, um, so it just adds another dimension to the excitement of the times. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to make sure that we, we highlighted that because again, that's another example you mentioned not only did they create a product or a, a, a solution to solve a problem, there's also an entire business model around it. It's just another great example of how you can tie work in school to a, a possible future career. And I know many of them actually have created businesses out of these. I've actually oh, yeah. interviewed one of them. So, so I wanted to make sure we highlighted that as well, because that's another great example of how their interests can end up, you know, dramatically impacting their future career. And, you know, again, We'll uh, we'll make sure we link to the Skills Twenty One website so people can see the past the past experiences and maybe check out the Facebook Live in June. So yeah. I want to thank both of you so much for for joining tonight. Uh, great great advice for our educators. Uh, some really fantastic resources. We'll link to both both your organizations in the show description so people can go check them out. And I appreciate everything both of you are doing for our uh, our students and our educators and our parents. Uh, here in the great state of Connecticut. And I hope you're both uh, continue to be healthy and safe. You too. You too. Thank you, Nick, for organizing. And yeah, thanks for bringing us together, Nick. Thanks, ladies. All right. Bye. Bye.